It f falls to me to provide a warm-up act before we uh, go on to the more learned colleagues who will tell you how we're going to save primary care and general practice. Because if primary care fails, the NHS fails, says Simon Stevens, and general practice is the jewel in the crown of the NHS. Somebody had to say it first, so it might as well be me. Now, does NHS England really mean it? Is it just a flattering cliché, a Machiavellian plan designed to distract us while we're dismantled? I had a word beginning with S before in my first draft, for instead of dismantled. To find out, it's vital to put things into context. After all, general practice has been here for a very long time. And that's what I think we're all here for. Jewel in the Crown, though, was coined by Benjamin Disraeli, the Prime Minister from 1874, who said that India was the brightest crown or brightest jewel in the crown of empire. Other people have given the version as costliest, and with the NHS going to be accounting for 38% of published expenditure by the end of the current round, costly could be the bon mot. The Royal Navy in the Napoleonic Wars only accounted for 25% of government expenditure. But Disraeli was a great social reformer. He brought in acts of public health, pollution, some clearance, and the Friendly Societies Act, which let ordinary people save money for primary care, for medical care. And a great admirer of uh, Disraeli was, believe it or not, Otto van, von Bismarck, who was the chancellor of the newly founded Germany, 1871, who introduced national insurance for pensions and sickness benefits in 1884. And he was much admired in turn by Lloyd George, Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1911, brought in the National Insurance Act. Anyone earning less than £160 a year bought a fourpenny stamp and stuck it in a book. You'll still hear people today talking about, I've paid my stamp. The employer played threepence and the taxpayer tuppence, or as Lloyd George put it, people were getting ninepence for fourpence. Benefits included 10 shillings a week sickness benefit for six months and five shillings for the next six months. You've got free TB treatment in a sanatorium and the right to be on a panel of a GP. And the local GPs were represented by the local medical committee. <laughs> now, the local medical committee was founded in 1911. This is actually a rare photograph of the inaugural meeting of Somerset LMC. <laughs> it's at the County Hotel in Taunton, as you can see. They're all, they're all men, you see. And you may just see in the front there a very young Harry Yoxall. <laughs> But we enter, really, the era of Dr Finlay's casebook, for those of you old enough to remember it. Just the GP, the patient, and the GMC, which was run in those days, breathe it softly, by doctors. The sword of Damocles of clinical responsibility hung over you 24 hours a day, 24-7, they didn't say that then. But you had complete autonomy. Patients paid one way or another, cash, usually on a sliding scale. Doctors were famous for judging to the farthing what you could actually afford. It has all changed now, Berge, hasn't it? Insurance, trade unions, or one of those friendly societies. Doctors were gods in those paternalistic days. There was no training and no gatekeeping. Anyone could go off and see a proper doctor, a consultant. The power and the money were in the hands of single-handed partners like Dr Cameron there on the left, often employing poorly salaried GPs who did all the work on the more or less mythical promise of a partnership. When the disillusionment set in, they moved on to be replaced by another sucker. Thank goodness that could never happen today. <laughs> Well, the Second World War brought in a consensus on social change and the place of central planning was secure. It had, after all, won the war. Not all went as far as the Labour politician uh, Douglas Jay, who gave us that expression, the gentleman in Whitehall really does know best. I'm sure we'd all agree with that, Michael, wouldn't we? Yes, he does agree. But the Beveridge report had cross-party consensus, cross-party support in the wartime coalition. And after the Labour landslide in 1945, it was brought in under 
Anirin Brevin. And uh, the statement under there, I think, is still well worth reading today. He wanted to spare young doctors from buying into practices and offered six pounds a week, or about 212 pounds a week today. But it was finally agreed that GPs would remain self-employed contractors, perhaps something resented by government ever since 1948. And in fact, if you look at various government policies since then, I think this is borne out. The chairman of the BMA warned that under the NHS there would be three people in every consultation. The patient, the doctor and the government telling you what you could and couldn't do. The beginning of the end of clinical autonomy. I always think Hattie Jake should appear in these things when we're talking about the NHS. The quote above is from Bevan who was the MP for Tredegar. This government was going to be involved in every aspect of the NHS. And, you know, with 38% of government expenditure, the risk of this country becoming a health service with a government attached, they're not going away. The great idea was that the NHS would pay for itself, as all the unmet need was dealt with, a worthy aim giving all the rickets, polio and tuberculosis, rheumatic fever and so forth. The cost of the NHS would go down every year. Interestingly, this idea of reducing costs for engaging patients recurs throughout the years, from the Gillibo report in 1956. Can you believe that? I'm indebted to Michael Bainbridge. We swap historical bon mot, don't we, from time to time? 1956, doesn't it not seem familiar? Uh, we've seen one less in 2002. The, even our own dear Sustainability and Transformation Partnership, which, again, we are encouraged to engage with patients for prevention and self-care. Mr Hancock said the same only this month. Oh, by the way, does anyone know what this week is designated as? Well, isn't that marvellous? NHS England's publicity machine is doing a grand job. It's NHS, it's NHS Self-Care Week this week. So luckily your practices are all empty because they're all looking after themselves. <laughs> Tremendous. I wonder how much they spent on publicising that. In fact, the NHS um, ran into its uh, first uh, funding crisis almost immediately. Bevan resigned on principle in 1951 because of charges brought in for spectacles and dentures. He was outraged, said it should all be free and resigned. The Collings report made grim reading in 1950. The NHS Act had intended that all GPs would be rehoused in new health centres, but they couldn't afford it. It's a sobering thought that most Somerset GPs still work in practices founded on those pre-1948 sites, give or take some new buildings, uh, relocations, branch surgeries and the odd anomalous relic of some long-forgotten reform. And reforms have been aplenty in response to those endless, recurring, relentless NHS crises, usually resulting in more money eventually coming to practices until the next crisis. The 1966 contract improved paying conditions, set maximum personal list size at 2,000, terms for premises and employing staff in what became known as the Red Book for the older ones amongst you. And that started the trend towards the um, modern group practices. In 1972, we even got a Royal College of our own. And in 1976, free three-year training became mandatory. Incidentally, uh, I had the privilege of interviewing some international GPs with NHS England a few weeks ago. And uh, they all loved what they perceived as the fairness of the NHS, given the private systems that even Doctor in the Republic of Ireland was familiar with. But one said it was GP training, which was truly the envy of the world. Ken Clark brought in his contract in 1990, a whole new era of external management and performance-related pay. GP fund holding allowed GPs to take on commissioning services, the idea being that they might have a better idea of what their patients actually needed than a bureaucrat. Tony Blair, remember his last slogan before the 1997 landslide? 24 hours to save the NHS. Of course you don't, but that's what he said. He abolished fund holding because it wasn't equitable. Not everyone could do it. And in the words of one GP, because the hospital needed the money. 
Yet another crisis. In 2002, Blair surprised everyone, including his own ministers, by announcing on television that the UK was going to match average, spending, average EU spending on health. And the result was the 2004 new contract, which, as Jeremy Hunt later said, was so generous that we all had to do penance for years. Hence, GP income is now down 20% on those heady days. In hours and out of hours were split, and quaff meant that about 10% of income was performance related. More regulation was to follow. <laughs> Appraisal, revalidation, the Care Quality Commission. GPs were again involved in virtual fund holding or practice based commissioning, remember that, and pilot GP commissioning from 2010. Andrew Lansley's Health and Social Care Act 2012 was the biggest structural change the NHS had ever had since its formation. He stood in this very room, ladies and gentlemen, probably on this very spot, and he said to cheers, the last thing the NHS needs is another top-down reform. <laughs> we didn't listen carefully enough to the politician top-down. This is a bottom-up reform. So after F FHSAs, PCGs, merge PCGs, PCTs, we have today's clinical commissioning group, with, which is GP-led and managerially supported and commissioned. But we have no money. Because astonishingly, all this was not enough to stave off yet another crisis. The problems have been elegantly expressed many times. Increasing workload, being treated like a community houseman by hospital teams who are always so very grateful if in their letters. Fears about partnership model, premises not being a one-way ticket to riches anymore aspiring costs of indemnity, fear of litigation, the status of GPs in the profession, from medical school to the Daily Mail. So the next once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to save the NHS was the five-year forward view in 2016. This time there was a difference. For some time, the NHS had been looking abroad, looking at health services abroad, and moving towards commissioning, not so much for specific services as health outcomes for specific populations. And this is being made flesh in the proposals for networks in net neighbourhoods of some 30 to 50,000. Any forward view money, funding or money released from efficiency savings in secondary care, what the STP is all about, that crock at the end of the NHS management rainbow, is not going to individual practices. Now we have to work at scale or be organised into integrated care services. But we start from a position of strength. Well worth remembering this. 86% of the public still like us. A rating only exceeded by the ambulance service, although their new response service, their new response time system is working on that. The CQC, God bless it, rates 96% of practices as good or outstanding. There are 10% more GP trainees this year uh, ahead of schedule. Nigel Watson from Wessex LMCs is conducting a review on partnership and all the very mer merits of it for the Secretary of State. Your LMC is running training on the 10 high impact changes and successful campaigns like GP in Somerset and GP Careers Plus is helping to recruit and retain GPs with solid results. Yeah. Somerset has a GP board bringing together the LMC, the provider group, uh, Acute Trust, CCG and CPEN GPs, which has made costed proposals for transformation schemes. And Sue Roberts will talk about that later, and there's more to hear in the afternoon. And there's even the promised state-backed indemnity scheme, details of which are always just about to be released. And there's even talk, ladies and gentlemen, even talk of the GMC recognising general practice as a speciality in its own right rather than a sort of dustbin they put you in if you're not a specialist in some other field. So how are we doing in our delivery points? Delivery points, ladies and gentlemen, is a charming NHS England expression for places that have been part of neighbourhoods since before the NHS was. Well, we're getting fewer and older. 
half of all partners and many nurses are over 50. We're working more intensely with more complicated patients. Consultation rates are up and phone calls have mushroomed. Does anyone remember when you had five or six phone calls at the end of a surgery? They were actually supposed to reduce face-to-face -face consultation. Now Mr Hancock wants apps, e-consulting and Skyping. And the danger, I think, is that these will be bolt-on added extras like the phone calls. Some have tackled this with more sophisticated triaging, signposting and so on. Martin Hughes will come and train you if you haven't seen him already. All paid for by NHS England. And uh, new models of care are working wonders in some areas, as uh, Steve Edgar will tell us later. But plenty have not made those changes and are always struggling. So what are we doing? in our 66 practices. They used to be 74, but mergers have occurred. Unlike happier, unhappier parts of the country, notably Plymouth, we have seen no contracts handed back or involuntary closures yet, largely due to the Berge Balian and his team at uh, Symphony. We now have figures for activity in practices, and it is estimated that we provide an astonishing three million consultations in Somerset every year. All, all kinds of consultation. 250,000 a month or 1,200, sorry, 12,500 every working day. Over half of these are still with a GP for all the changes in skill mix and all the other healthcare professionals. The busiest day so far in TNS A and E, they saw 262 patients. If 1% of our lot pitched up, they'd have almost half as much again and the whole system would collapse. Yet two visits to the emergency department yields the hospital more money than you lot get for a whole year. Finally, the STP has produced a very good report written by, amongst others, Michael Bainbridge, who's on next. Mr Bainbridge is uh, an unusual manager and we're not allowed to praise him because NHS England may come to hear of it and therefore blight his career. I will say no more. The report has rightly concluded that the people of Somerset need and value high-quality local GP services that we're still doing a good job and that there's a wide variation, uh, that we're still doing a good job but under extreme pressure, just as Collings said in 1950. There is a wide variation in access and in that vital continuity of care because there is now hard evidence that seeing somebody you know and trust means fewer admissions, fewer prescriptions and fewer emergency admissions. But who's seeing your patients today? What do we mean by continuity of care? Always seeing the same person? No chance of that. All these group practices, all these part-timers working for the CCG, or the LMC for that matter. Having the medical records available, is that continuity of care? I think NHS England think it is. And what will improved access and GP-led urgent treatment centres do to continuity of care? The same GPs working in more places? Well, at the end, it says that innovation is uneven and general practice in Somerset is not able to be the foundation of modern integrated care system. Urgent action once again <coughs> is required. Once again, general practice is at a crucial point in its long history. We remain a national treasure valued by patients and communities, the jewel in the NHS crown. We have to learn from the past. I understand that uh, Michael's going to quote Marx later on. I think he means Karl, not Groucho. But Hegel said, one of the lessons of history is that people don't learn the lessons of history. And Arnold Toynbee, that's um, Polly's granddad, said that history is just one damn thing after another. Well, the profession has changed over the years, and this is simply the latest round. The question today is whether we want to lead that change or allow it to be done to us 
and risk throwing out what's good about traditional general practice, the baby of continuity of care with the bathwater of endless reform. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Barry.